folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Matthew chapter 24. We're still dealing with false prophets. And we've so far we've talked about, you know, guys like Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Rodney Howard Brown, the Pope, Ellen White, Joe Smith. I still don't think that's his real. I think he made that up. What's your name, sir? Uh, Joe Smith? Yeah. Um, we've talked about all these as false prophets, Dr. O'War, given proof that they are because what they said doesn't match what God said in his word. So now the next question is, is it possible that your local pastor or bring it down home, your local Bible study leader could be a false teacher, false prophet. Or maybe this would be popular with me. Maybe I'll get a lot of YouTube hits for this one. Maybe the people you're watching on YouTube are false prophets and false teachers. Let's find out. Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And I love that contrast. Many false prophets and many people are going to believe them. And that's exactly how it is. Think about the, think about the size of all these churches in your area. They're huge. 500 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people. Joel Olstein can get 90,000 people, I think, inside, no, it's like 50,000, 60,000, something like that, inside that basketball court that he uses, pretends he's a church, right? And then all the guys and gals on YouTube, on Facebook, whose videos reach into the hundreds of thousands of hits, views. And everybody says, oh wow, listen to this, man, this is it right here. This, they're exposing this, they're talking about this. And it may be popular, and a lot of people are gonna fall for it. But Jesus said, that's exactly one of the marks, not, not the mark, but one of them of a false prophet, a false teacher. But then he said, then the gospel. And you remember what Jesus also said about few there be that find it when he was talking about straight is the way and narrow is the gate. There's not many of us who still hold to what's in this book and won't leave it. So God's not going to use millions and millions of YouTube videos and popular Christianity to save the world. He's going to use Gideon's 300, who will just stand. Stand. Don't move. Don't budge. Don't walk away. Don't walk backward, especially, from the words that are in this book. And you shine the light with one hand and hold up the sword in another and cry, the sword of the Lord. And God will, God will preach the gospel to all the world. He didn't say that everybody was going to be saved because of it. He's just going to let them know, this is it right here. This is your last chance. And if you don't change now, you don't come to me now, God says, it'll be too late. The door of the ark is about ready to shut. So, I mentioned your local pastor, local Bible study leader, Local, well, there couldn't be local. Your internet pastor, and I'm going to say this. I am not above anything that's in this book. Not one thing. What I'm going to say today applies just as much to me as it does anybody else that I might be referring to. So, if in your eyes you think that I have strayed, not from conspiracy theories, because they come and go, right? Remember, remember Y2K? 
It's going to shut the whole world down. Tribulation is going to start. Rapture is going to happen. Didn't happen. Remember the whatever comet was supposed to come around the sun, crash into the earth? That didn't happen. Remember 2012? That didn't happen. Remember all the rapture dates? Those didn't occur. Remember how certain people were supposed to do this and that was going to bring in this? And I mean, it happens every year. Every year, there's a new fad on the internet. Okay, so don't judge me against not falling for those. Judge me against what's in this book. I'm not above it. And if you feel that I have violated in a significant fashion. I'm wrong about lots of things. But if you feel that I've significantly violated and strayed away from this book, then don't watch me ever again. Pray for me. Okay? Fair enough? All right. Jeremiah 23. God comes out very strongly. Woe be unto the pastors. And when it, whenever you see the word woe in the Bible, think of uh, Revelation. In Revelation chapter 9, he talks about two woes have been accomplished. The third woe is coming. So whenever God says, before Revelation, whenever God says, Whoa, unto you, I think he means they're going to get that that he mentions in Revelation 9. And that's bad stuff. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And he says that to pastors. Guys, if you're a pastor, God does hold us to a higher standard than everybody else. If you think that your people should be right up there with you on studying the Bible, knowing the Bible, feeding yourself from the Bible and so on, I would say that it falls upon us as the apostles said. That's why they formed the office of deacons so that the apostles would not have to leave the word of God and go serve tables. Not that serving tables was beneath them. It's just that that was their responsibility. Guys, we're supposed to be the smartest people in the room when it comes to this book. And if we haven't been studying or if we've been buying our sermons online, you know, I can remember a time when that sounded like a pretty good idea. But if we haven't been studying, we haven't been in this book, we cannot give what we do not have. And it falls on us because God is going to judge us with the evil. Now, he's going to get everybody else, but he's going to get us with the evil of our doings. That's what he said. Now, verse 11, for both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore, their ways shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. Notice that slippery ways instead of smooth, straight ways. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. Let me stop right here. Do you know how I know this is true? Because God did it to me. Back in the years when I said, oh, the King James has mistakes in it. All the Bibles are wrong and I need to study Greek and be smart like you know, Dr. So-and-so. That's when God got me. And I mean, he got, and of course I was going to follow Rick Warren and Bill Hybels and have a rock and roll band and I won't get into the rest. But that, I know that's true. Because I was in slippery ways. I was in them bad. And God brought me out. See, sometimes his judgment is just to get our attention. Like in the days of Josiah, when Josiah became king, I mean, God, God was already had enough to get Israel. And Josiah's, one of Josiah's men found the book, brought it to Josiah and read it. And Josiah wept. And he said, guys, we got we to gotta do something. And he repented to God and God said, okay, I won't do it in your lifetime. See how it works? Maybe God will get your attention one of these days. 
I hope he will. Um, For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. Verse 13. And I've seen folly. In the pro- you know he charged his angels with folly, don't you? You know what kind of foolishness that is. Strange flesh. I've seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal, which means that they didn't get it from the Bible. They got it from a different spirit, a seducing spirit, a doctrine of devil. And caused my people Israel to err. I've seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of the evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Well, we know what happened there. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood, and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Now, you're going to like this. What does God mean when he says... I'm going to feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of God. What does he mean by that? Can you, can you dig up a verse in your card file of verses that you've read before and think of one where something tastes like wormwood? Uh, he accused them of prophesying in Baal. I mentioned that. Commit adultery, walk in lies, literally adulterers fornicators, some even sodomites, some even going after children, and they strengthen the hands of the evildoers. They won't preach against certain sins, or in fact most sins, except for like, you know, racism is a terrible sin, and everybody's racist, and and they they cry out social justice stuff, because that's what's popular now. Black lives do matter, and we need to love it. They talk about some sins, but not the sins that those people are guilty of. And he knows it. He knows it. He knows that half the couples in that church are living in adultery, sin, not married. He knows that some of those people are sodomites. In fact, He'll even do their wedding if they ask him. He is strengthening the hands of the evildoers so that nobody returns from their wickedness. Listen, I want people living in sin in my church. I want sodomites in my church. I want drunkards and dope heads in my church. I want people who are addicted to this, that, and the other. I want them all in my church. I want them listening to me. You know why? Because I'm going to give them what's in this book so they can return and turn from their wickedness but to deliberately not preach against their sin. Well, that might offend them. We don't want to offend them. They have to be confronted with God's law first. If you're against capital punishment and you think that prisons reform people, then ask yourself the question, why is it that in church we can't confront the sinner with his sin Let him know that there is a harsh judgment coming for it so that they can be reformed from their sin. See, I'm just kind of giving the liberal spiel here. Most liberals are against, in fact, all liberals are against capital punishment. God instituted capital punishment. He never rescinded it. Never. In fact, God is the one who's going to judge the world and give them capital punishment. God is at the end of the world. But to preach endlessly about how everybody can have a better life, but not turn away from their sin, all you're doing is strengthening the hands of the evildoers. And I'm going to say this, Pastor, you're the reason why we just had the election stolen in this country. Because most of these politicians claim that they go to a church somewhere every now and then. And I guarantee you they wouldn't dare step foot in a church that preached against their sin while they're sitting there doing it. So God said he's going to feed them with wormwood. What does that mean? Well, that's what he did me. And then I found out how bitter it was. Decided I didn't like it. I don't 
You know, they say apple cider vinegar with the mother is healthy for you. I don't believe that. Anything you gag on can't be good for you, in my opinion. I don't like sour stuff. I don't like sour candy. I don't. I don't like sweet tarts. I don't like anything like that. Okay? Bitter things. I don't like bitter things. I like my coffee sweetened, a little cream. Okay? So I found out how bitter these other Bibles were. And that's where it goes. Remember I told you, God said he'd feed them with wormwood, right? What is, what is wormwood? Deuteronomy 32. Verse 32, for their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. So, the fact that a preacher turns away from the King James and turns to these other translations only to eventually, mostly, if not all the way, turn away all the way from the Bible. I'll show you a guy that has turned his back on every Bible. And it's a name you know. Every Bible. He don't trust any of them. In fact, you probably won't preach out of them ever again. Okay? So that's, that's not the disease. The disease is not turning to the other translations. That's a symptom of the disease. The disease was their sin and the fact that they pacify sinners including themselves and their family in the house of the Lord and won't preach against sin, will not confront the sinner with his judgment in order to redeem him. They refuse to do it. That's the disease. That's why they turned away from the King James and went after the vine of Sodom. And what does the vine of Sodom produce? Fruits. Deuteronomy 29, verse 16. How does this happen? You ask the question, how does this happen? For you know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt and how we came through the nations which he passed by. And you have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turned away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Let me stop right here. I know what this is like. So what he's saying here is, you pass through all these nations in, in the wilderness. By the way, the wilderness was a testing to see who is and who isn't going to make it into the promised land. That's what it was for. So when I was a teenager in high school, our choir director, I was always in band on choir, and um, our choir director took us to a music festival down south, and he knew of a Catholic church, and he wanted us, it was one that he had uh, performed, he wrote a mass as part of a doctorate degree, and he had it performed there, and he wanted us to see this church. So we went to that church, we went up in the choir. Now, Catholic churches are amazing. They're they're absolutely, when you see all that gold, you just go, wow. So he took us up in the choir loft, up high, and had us sing a song that we had learned in Latin, part of the mass or whatever. And we sang it a cappella, which means no organ music, nothing playing. And we sang it, and I remember the feeling I got, like I was in heaven. Like, it was like this euphoria of hearing this music inside, around, midst all this gold and silver and all these religious icons, right? And I, I felt that feeling because other religions can be eye candy. You know what that is? Things that lust of the eyes. And I caught it. I caught that virus in that church for a brief time. It didn't last, but it was a brief time. So I get it. What he's saying here, you pass through and you saw these other religions and they looked good to you. 
and you fell for it. You said, wow, what, what would it be like if we could bring this into our religion? And that's what they did. So look at what God said. He said, lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. See, the vine of Sodom has a root in it. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And that root will spring up. And once it comes out and you start bearing gall and wormwood, now you're turned over to the vine of Sodom. You see what sin does? Sin turns us into bad theologians. Bad theologians. So your local pastor or the Bible study leader or the youth pastor or the hundreds of thousands of YouTube teachers and they're teaching awful rotten theology teaching horrible doctrines of devils you know how they got that way lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life and God's just turned them over and he's not going to let him come back. And you say, well, I don't believe everything he says, but I, I like how he talks about, you know, the new world order here, or I like how he talks about this over here. I... Don't you understand that every now and then you'll get a sweet taste from the vine of Sodom. And you say, well, I don't listen to it when he says that. I don't like that. Well, I don't, I know he uses a different Bible, but Understand that you've already got the root in you. It's already, are you born with it? Your responsibility is to make sure that root never sees the light of day to flourish. That's your job. So he says in verse 19, And it came to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he blessed himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. Revelation 9. Smoke rising up out of the furnace. Shall smoke against that man and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I can't say it enough. I hate every false way. Why? Because I know what it did to me. And it still wants to. I'm not out of the fire yet. It still wants to. And I'll, I'll just be honest with you. A root that I got in me is, might give up. You're wasting your time. These people aren't listening to you. That's in me. And I have a responsibility to myself, to my family, to my church, to my God, and to you people to never let that root see the light of day. But it ain't easy on some days. It's not. So if I've got it in me, you've got it in you. Be careful what you're listening to, who you're listening to, what kind of things you're watching on the internet. Even if, even if you're not looking at naked women or men or whatever, be careful of the people you're listening to, to let you, to, to influence you. Because the serpent never announced to Eve what his real goal was. And they won't either. Jeremiah 23, back to Jeremiah 23, verse 21. God said, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they'd stood in my counsel 
and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God? Stop right here and think about what he, what he means by this. Had the preachers done their job, we would not even be close to the condition we're in right now in this country or any other country. Had the preachers done their job, we wouldn't be in this mess. It'd be back in the days when to vote Democrat would have just meant that you're for the working man or whatever they stood for back, you know, in uh, FDR days. Which I'm not all favor of that. I'm not totally against it. I don't know where I stand. I just know the Democrat Party now ain't what your granddaddy voted for. And if the pastors had done their job, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. That's what that means. Verse 23, am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God far off? Stop think about that. Well, I'm never going to get done with this lesson today. There's so much richness in this book. It's, am I not a God at hand? Let's see. Hmm. I've read that before. Where would it be? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Is he not a God at hand? It's right in your hand. You won't read it. You'll, here's what you'll do. You'll spend hours researching, watching YouTube videos. And because the guy on the video mentioned something that sounded like it was from the Bible, that satisfies your daily need for the Word of God. You will tell yourself, I don't have to read the Bible now. I mean, that guy mentioned, you know, something, a story out of the Bible. He mentioned the, the beast. He mentioned the beast. Well, that's religious. I don't have to read the Bible today. And you won't. Am I not a God at hand, God said. Am I not right there? I mean, it'd be different if God didn't give us any of his words and they was locked up in heaven somewhere, and we, we don't know what God, maybe God says this, maybe God is talking through this guy. But God says, you have me right here. You just didn't bother to look. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name, for Baal. What is the Lord's name? Well, I just said it, didn't I? So all the Hebrew roots of sacred name Bibles do exactly that. They take out the Lord, which I've shown you from scriptures, is how you translate yod Hey vah Hey, The four letters in Hebrew, God said, Jesus said, Lord, that's what he said. He said it in Greek, Kyrios. Every time the New Testament quotes the Old Testament where those four letters are, they always translated it, Lord, always. In the Greek, they said Kyrios, Lord. But then they did something else. And I used to do this. I remember going to Reg Kelly's church saying this word, Yahweh. You know why? So I heard Bible college. That's the real, that's how you really pronounce it. Yahweh. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Let me show you. Five, two, is seven. Seven times the name Jehovah 
is in your King James Bible. Now, doesn't that sound right to you? Instead of like 13 or 666, right? Seven times Jehovah's found in the King James Bible. Exodus 6, 3, Jehovah. Psalm 83, 18, Jehovah. Isaiah 12, 2, Lord Jehovah. Isaiah 26, 4, Lord Jehovah. And then Genesis 22, 14, Jehovah Jireh. Exodus 17, 15, Jehovah Nisi. Judges 6, 24, Jehovah Shalom. Now, Pastor, what's your point? The King James is the only Bible where it has those in it. Not even in the new King James will you ever find the phrase Jehovah or the name Jehovah. You don't even find Yahweh. They changed it. They changed it. And of course, the NIV, New American Standard, Christian Standard Bible, and you name it, they all took them out. They did the same thing that the sacred name Bibles did with God's name, the Lord. They just took it out. Yahuwah, or whatever. None of them. No, that, I don't know of a sacred name Bible in the universe that says Jehovah. They will say Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, but not Jehovah. Now, back to Jeremiah 23, verse 30. Therefore, behold, I'm against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. It means they said, now, put your Bible down. Listen to what I'm saying. Behold, I'm against the prophet, saith the Lord, that use their tongues, and say, he saith. Behold, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies. And by their likeness, yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. And then he says in verse 34, And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say, The burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man in his house. Ooh. You see, that's how God got me. I was raised well by a family that believed in family by a mom and dad that loved their children, by grandparents that loved their grandkids. And I loved my children. And God used my children one day. He said, Mike, I'll take them away. And that scared me. That scared me. So that's what he said. I will even punish that man and his house. Verse 35, thus shall you say everyone to his neighbor and everyone to his brother, what hath the Lord answered? And what hath the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Now remember, I, what I said, very first part of this series there is never, ever, ever, ever has been, is now, or will be a false prophet who says, just read the King James Bible and believe it and you will be fine. You will have eternal life. What is the common denominator of, all, you know what a denominator is, right? If I were to give you like three, five numbers, 50, 100, 250, 300, 400, 1,000. Common denominator of all of those numbers is 10. I made it easy, right? The common denominator of every false prophet is that they will tell you this is wrong. Somehow, some way, they will tell you this is wrong listen to me or this doesn't have it all listen to me common denominator every one of them so how do you find false prophets just listen and when they say now this is a poor translation a better translation is that's a sign that's not that's one sign but it happens to be the common denominator take some false prophets that we've mentioned. Ellen White, Joseph Smith, Jim Jones. I watched a documentary about him the other day. Jim Jones, 
David Koresh, okay? What's, what's, what's with all of them? They either said the Bible was wrong, wasn't translated correctly, or it didn't have enough in it. God gave me extra to add to it. Common denominator amongst all of them. So, you're listening to a YouTube video, or you're listening to a sermon, or you're reading a blog post, or you're reading a Facebook post, or even a meme. And the guy believes the Bible either is wrong or it doesn't have enough in it. But you keep listening to him. You're listening to a false prophet. And my friends, I can't keep up. I'm doing seven sermons a week every week, trying hard. I used to do eight and you know my health not what it used to be I'm, i can't quite keep up with that schedule and i push myself to do all seven sunday school sunday morning sermon sunday night sermon wednesday night two pastor mike onlines and a watchman broadcast and sometimes i can't get all seven in for health reasons or whatever the false prophets out there are many there's thousands of them everywhere. And I'm trying to give you as much of the Word of God as I can. But there are more voices out there that speak against this book. And my question is, in your mind, who's going to win out in the end? The false prophets that lie or the Word of God? So I just, I just, I won't listen to them unless I'm going to research them to find out what they said. To find it, if I find out what they said, that would be why I would listen to something like that, to find out how wrong it is. But remember, garbage in, garbage out. What goes into the man, it, it doesn't defile him. But once it's in there, it starts finding a way out. And when it does, it will defile you. Now, let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter is like the crown jewel of what constitutes a false teacher and a false prophet. 2 Peter, and you could do a parallel study of Jude. Uh, 2 Peter 2 and Jude go hand in hand. They say very similar things and would cause some liberal scholar to say, well, I think they were reading from the source document. And nah, the Holy Ghost gave two witnesses to everything that we're going to see. Second Peter is one, Jude is the other. So you can read Second Peter and then study Jude. And in fact, it'd be a good idea. You want to do it on paper or do it on a, you know, Word document or something like that and just do a comparison of how Peter and Jude say the same thing, but two different ways. Be a good study, okay? It'll help you. We're going to stick with 2 Peter for the most part. And I'm going to show you the two main things that a false prophet will always do. And they'll do it every single time. So let's get into it. 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Verse 2, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness. Now it's getting into their motives, why they're doing what they're doing. Through covetousness, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Let's just take that last part just for a few minutes. And let's examine, let's, let's look at the, the Bible publishers. In the world, the Bible publishers. What is their primary motivation for publishing the NIV, New American Standard, Holman, 
publishing company's Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Message Bible, the New English Version, the Revised Standard Version. What is their number one reason? Now, they may say in their PR department, well, we want people to be able to understand the Word of God. King James uses archaic language. We want them to understand it. We have fresh, a fresh uh, interpretation of the Bible, a fresh translation of the Bible. You always use that word fresh and new and improved and better and all kinds of stuff, right? But that's all garbage. Why does company B want to sell a product that company A is already selling? Is it because they really do think they have a better one? No. To make part of the market money that company A is getting into. To share the money. That's why they're doing it. Love of money. This, I mean, this Bible's right. The love of money is the root of all evil. The other translations say the love for money is a root of all evil. But it's not the one. This one's right. So, why did Zondervan come up with a Bible that was so significantly different that they could copyright it. Money. That way, see, they could sell a different Bible, number one. Number two, they could charge people for using that Bible in their books, literature, and gospel tracts. A church, this was years ago, so I don't remember the church, but I remember the story. A church Arizona, I think, something like that, big church, decided they were going to distribute hundreds of thousands of gospel tracts all around their area. And they got in big trouble from Zondervan. You know why? They used the NIV in their gospel tracts. Didn't get permission. And Zondervan Press charged them royalties, money. They could have just used King James and not had to pay that. Because outside of the United Kingdom, the King James is free of charge. You don't have to get anybody's permission to use King James Bible. Nowhere. The Gideons, giving away millions of Bibles all over the world, right? Why did they go and start printing revised English version, New King James, NIVs? Because they have to pay royalties on those. Whereas if they printed King James, they don't have to pay anybody. They don't owe anybody a dime. So the cost of making the Bibles now just went up significantly. So what would cause a company who gives away millions of Bibles all over the world, what would cause them to go to translations where they have to pay now for the right to print that Bible? Sounds like a conspiracy, doesn't it? It sounds like they no longer want people reading the King James. So the two things that set that absolutely pinpoints that you've got a false teacher or a false prophet on your hands. Number one, they will deny the Lord that bought them. Number two, they will speak evil of the King James Bible. Let's break this down. First thing, denying the Lord that bought them. Take a look at these quotes. Christ never suffered. How could suffering be associated with the one? Maharishi Mahesh Yogi said that. I don't like Christianity's emphasis on the cross. It's so morbid. A disciple of Sai Baba said that. Elise Bailey, who was Helena Blavatsky's uh, sort of uh, protege. A divine son of God has come forth and under many different names. Here's another one. The Messiah promised in each religion, the Lord Maitreya, Krishna, the Imam Mahdi, the Christ, is the same divine principle called by several names. In fact, there was a guy named Benjamin Cream. We got a quote by him here in a little bit. Benjamin Cream put out in 1980 full-page ads 
in papers all over the world saying the coming one is, is near. He's, he's about ready to show the world that he's the Savior. He is the Christ of Christianity. He is the Imam Mahdi of Islam. He is the, uh, what was the other ones here? The Lord Maitreya. He is Krishna. He is, in other words, he is all of these divine beings from all these religions all wrapped up into one. There is no other Christ. So if you think that Christ is part of a series of godly ascended masters who've come to save the world at various times in history, then you're one of them. You're not one of us. Um, Ramakrishna considers God to be manifest in various ways and various forms as the Divine Mother, as Krishna, as Jesus, so we have all of these new age weirdos, all of these uh, Indian gurus, you name it, Satanists. They're all saying, and these would be false prophets, and, but they're all predicting that there is coming a new age when these enlightened beings are going to come down, Jesus, Krishna, uh, the Imam Mahdi, the 12th Imam of Islam and others. They're all going to come. They're going to bring the world together into one religion. We're all going to be brothers. We're all going to be supermen. That's your fourth kingdom right there. They're denying the Lord that bought them. Elizabeth Clare Prophet spoke of, quote, the erroneous doctrine concerning the blood sacrifice of Jesus. Remember, they will deny the Lord that bought them. How did Jesus buy us? With his blood. So they are against the blood atonement, the substitutional sacrifice, where Christ is a substitute in our place for us, where Christ suffered for our sins, and Isaiah 53 says it pleased God to bruise him. You know, I used to watch a lot of Star Trek. And I remember uh, Star Trek, it was one of the movies, not the Undiscovered Country. But it's where they went to the center of the galaxy and they found, because they were Spock's brother was looking for God, right? And they got there and this being was trapped on this planet, the center of the galaxy, and he was inflicting harm on everybody. And Bones said this statement. I'll not serve any God who inflicts pain for his own pleasure. And I watched that and I, I immediately thought of Isaiah 53. It pleased God to bruise him. And I went, that verse was written to deny scripture. That part of that movie was written to deny scripture. I kind of started backing away from Star Trek after that. Uh, Benjamin Cream, who I mentioned a while ago, he was the, he's sort of the John the Baptist of the New Age movement. And by the way, he predicted that the Lord Maitreya would come out and be the savior of the world in 1980. Well, he's about 40 years late, isn't he? Benjamin Cream said, blood sacrifice, a picture of the Christ impossible for the majority of thinking people. Buddhist Church of America says, patience and perseverance matter more than the blood of crucifixion. The Aquarian Gospel of, of Jesus the Christ says, a God that takes delight in sacrifice in blood is not my Father God. You know what? I'm pretty sure they're right about that. Virginia Molencott, you know who she is? She's the butch lesbian who helped translate the NIV. And see, they denied that. They, they tried to cover that up for years. And Virginia Molencott just kept coming out more and more, writing books and living with this other gal. So it's hard to deny it. Even James White said, there was no lesbian on the translating committee. James White hates King James people. 
But when all you got to do is take one look at her and you're going, yeah, she's a butch lesbian. Yep. And she's admitted it. She's out there open about it. Here's what she's, here's what, here's what a member of the translation committee said about Jesus Christ. I can no longer worship in a theological context that depicts God as an abusive parent and Jesus as the obedient, trusting child. Sounds like, and this is sad, but sounds like to me she got abused as a child. That's what it sounds like. And instead of, because I know people who have been abused as children, and they love the Lord. I know people who are abused by parents, and they love the Lord. You know why? They don't see God as an abusive parent. They see God as the father that they always wanted to have as a child. And I feel sorry for her. She's a false teacher, false prophet. What was she doing translating the Bible? But I feel sorry for her. Because she obviously took, I'm just guessing now, whatever abuse she might have received as, as a child and conveyed that against the God of this Bible. See, you know what an idol is? An idol is your imagination making a God because you didn't see the God. You just imagined. And so Virginia Mullincott imagines a God who won't abuse Jesus. Now, God didn't abuse Jesus. And she makes it sound like that Jesus was going, Father, why do I have to do this? I didn't do anything wrong. Jesus himself said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was a willing participant in it. And I feel sorry for people who think otherwise. Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland said, when his blood was poured out, it did not atone. See, Kenneth Copeland believes that he, and he said this, there's a recording of it. I guarantee you look it up on the internet. There's a recording of it. Him saying it. Him saying that God told him that a twice, and I'm using his language, a twice born man could have atoned for man's sins. And Copeland said, good God. He says that a lot. Are you saying? Yes. Kenneth Copeland believes that he could have died on the cross and atoned for man's sins because he was a twice born man. I don't, he, he's not really born again. That's what he said. He's denying the Lord that bought them. And then there's Dr. Awar. Remember what he said? The Messiah was now with defect from the nail pierce and hence could not qualify to become, to be a perfect lamb without defect as was the law. Now again, all you people in Kenya that are, really angry with me. He said that, you know he did. You take that to the word of God and ask God whether what he said is true or not. Don't ask him, don't ask me. Ask God and look for the answer in your Bible. So, number one, they deny the Lord that bought them. Okay? And then we have the Catholic Church, who is, I mean, like any day now, they're going to come out and make it official that Mary is co redemptrix, meaning that her suffering was as equal to Christ's suffering 
Therefore, God uses her equal to Jesus Christ to redeem man from his sins. Here's a, a, a copy of a website, the church's teaching on Mary's cooperation in the redemption of mankind. And it gives various quotes, Leo the 13th, Leo the 13th, St. Pius the X, Benedict the XV, Pius the XI, John the XXIII, who said, we trust that they will imitate in her the most perfect model of union with Jesus, our head. We trust that they will join Mary in the offering of the divine victim. And then he said, intimately associated in the redemption, in the eternal plans of the Most High, Our Lady, as Severianus of Gabala sang, is the mother of salvation, the fountain of light made visible. The Vatican II Constitution on the Church said, So also the Blessed Virgin advance in her, and this is in 1963, advance in her pilgrimage of faith, and faithfully bore with her union with her son, even to the cross, where, in accord with the divine plan, she stood, vehemently grieved with her only begotten. And, oh, that itself, that itself, blasphemy. Her only begotten. It's a lie. She had children after Jesus. See, they by saying her only begotten son, they put her on the same level as God the Father and joined herself to his sacrifice with a motherly heart, lovingly consenting to the immolation of the victim born of her. In conceiving Christ, in giving birth to him, in feeding him, in presenting him to the Father in the temple, in suffering with him, as he died on the cross, she cooperated in the work of the Savior in an altogether singular way by obedience, faith, hope, and burning love to restore supernatural life to souls. <laughs> That, that angers me. There is nobody like our Savior. Nobody. Nobody equal to Him. Nobody better than Him. Nobody before Him. I won't pray to Mary. I won't confess my sins to any man or any priest anywhere. I can go directly to God, my Father, through my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ alone. They deny the Lord that bought them. Now, the second thing he said was, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now, some might say, well, the truth is Christianity. The truth is Jesus Christ. Okay? But... What does the Bible say the way of truth is? It actually defines it for you and narrows it down to one specific thing. Psalm 119.30 I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. There it is. The way of truth is the book. John 17.17 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Two witnesses, both of them telling you this is the way of truth. So they will speak evil of not a Bible, even though some, they're denying all Bibles, which I knew was coming. I knew that the other translations were a step away from the King James, but not the end result, not the final journey. The final journey is to remove all churches away from any Bible, no matter how bad it is. But you got to get them away from the way of truth first. Once you've got them on that journey, they'll just, they'll just follow and go wherever these devils take them to. So let's look at statements in regard to that. The Catholic Catechism. Inasmuch as it is manifest from experience that if the Holy Bible translated into the vulgar tongue be indiscriminately allowed to everyone, the temerity of men will cause more evil than good to arise from it. It is, on this point, referred to the judgment of the bishops and inquisitors, who may, by the advice of the priest or confessor, 
permit the reading of the Bible, translated into the vulgar tongue by Catholic authors to those persons whose faith and piety they apprehend will be augmented and not injured by it, and this permission they must have in writing. But if anyone shall have the presumption to read or possess it without such written permission, he shall not receive absolution until he have first delivered up such Bible to the ordinary. They won't let you read the Bible without their permission. They speak evil the way of the truth. Then it says, same Catholic catechism. Finally, it is enjoined on all the faithful that no one presume to keep or read any books contrary to these rules or prohibited by this index. But if anyone read or keep any books composed by heretics or the writings of any author suspected of heresy or false doctrine, he shall instantly incur the sentence of excommunication. And those who read or keep works interdicted on another account besides the mortal sin committed shall be severely punished at the will of the bishops. Man, that sounds mean. They hate the King James Bible. They hate it. Here's somebody else who hates the King James Bible. James R. White. The King James only controversy, can you trust modern translations? Now, first time I ever saw that book online, I'm going, Wow, there's another book promoting the King James. No. Uh uh. Our friend Chris Pinto, he's debated James R. White. Okay? He's one of these. He, if, if anybody epitomizes the scholarly elite, James White does. Very, very arrogant about, and he's smooth talking. He knows this, he knows this stuff which is why he gets into debates. He's very smooth talking, very persuasive, but he lies. He lies. And I've listened to him. I don't have a copy of that book. I wouldn't buy it. But I watched a YouTube video. Where he's, he's debating Dr. Jack Mormon on a British television show in front of an audience. And I listened to what James R. White said of why he believes the King James is inferior to other Bibles and why the modern text, the Nesalalan Greek text in the 28th revision, is superior to the Textus Receptus and, and whatever. So I'm going to play portions of that particular video that I watched of him and I want you to listen to what he says. Take a listen. So one of my questions this evening for you in the audience and especially for Pastor Mormon is this. Is there any place in the King James where we've come up with a better translation than what appeared in 1611? I would, I would expect that you would have to believe that because no one here uses the 1611 KJV. If you're reading a standard King James Version today, you're using the 1769 Blaney Revision. That's what's normally printed. But there's two editions of that, the Oxford and the Cambridge edition, and they're not identical to one another. Almost nobody reads the 1611. But even if you did, then you would know that there were changes made after the 1611. And so, which one's the final authority? All right, stop right here. That one I fell four years ago. That we don't have the same King James Bible as the 1611. I fell for that one a long time ago. From an esteemed scholar of the denomination. I told you about that. Where he said, well, if you believe the King James, you believe the 1611, you believe the, six, the 1769 version, or the ones in between there, because they're all different. They've been changed thousands of times. Well, the American Bible Society, back in 1850, did a study on this. They compared the original 1611 Bible with the, quote, revisions that these guys claimed makes them all different. And you know what they concluded? That other than changes in spelling and correcting printing errors, the King James Bible that they had in 1611 is exactly the same King James Bible that they had in 1850, and it's not been revised since then. 
The Bible that we have is over 400 years old, and the words have remained exactly the same. See, that's a common ploy. They think that you won't do the, the research. They think that this is something that you will never find out on your own, and you can't. I've even had somebody claim that the 1611 was written in Middle English, and you can't even read the words. Well, that's a lie. You can. I have somebody sent me a page out of a 1611 Bible, a real 1611 page out of the 1611 Bible. I've got it hanging on the wall in my office. You can read every word on it. And they're exactly the same as the words that are in this one. So that's lie number one that I caught him in. Here's another one. He mentions a Greek word, hasios. Now he's got him, because he knows that nobody there speaks Greek. And he says, every other Bible translated it in like Revelation 16 as the Holy One. And all the other Bibles all agree that King James is the only one that translates it incorrectly as shalt be. Take a listen. And what about those places where the Textus Receptus is absolutely alone in its reading? No Greek manuscript in the world ever has what it has in its, in its reading. For example, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 5, uh, both, both of these texts, and I can show you right, right where they are, both of these texts used by the King James translators in Revelation 16, 5, Speak of God as the one who is and who was the Holy One. Hasios is the Greek term. Both of them say the same thing. In 1598, Beza made what's called a conjectural emendation. That is, he conjectured. He looked at the form of the word and he said, You know, I bet that was originally esomenos, which means and shall be. And so that's what he put in his Greek text. And that's what the King James translators translated. No one before 1598, reading a Greek New Testament, had ever seen that before. It's in the King James Version to this day. Why? Oh my goodness. The King James has an error in translation because all of the other translations say, Holy One, not shalt be, like the King James does. Well, I did some research. James R. And if you go to Blue Letter Bible, you can actually read the Septuagint. Let me explain what the Septuagint is. There, in, in some books, it'll be marked as LXX, the 70. Okay, because back, oh, I don't know when it was, a couple thousand years ago, a thousand years ago, something like that. The Jews took the Hebrew Bible and translated it into Greek because... The common language at the time of the early church was Greek. And Hebrew was dying as a language. Jews weren't speaking Hebrew. So they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And you can actually, if you look up certain words, I won't get into the details of how to do it, but you can find Septuagint readings on blueletterbible.org. So I looked up that word, hasios. And you know what I found? That in the Septuagint, about a half a dozen times, the Jewish translators who translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek translated the word hasios as shall be. And what the King James translators did was, when they saw the word hasios in Revelation 16, they knew that it should follow the reading, not only of the Septuagint, but of the other places in the book of Revelation where Jesus as described is the one who was and is and is to come. So now look at this verse. Revelation 16, 5. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and the holy? No. And shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. The King James translators knew this. They knew that the only proper way to translate hasios, to follow the flow of the text and other readings in Revelation, was instead of putting the Holy One there, 
to finish it out, was, is, and shall be. Just See, like there are words in English that sound the same and are spelled the same. They have two different meanings. Can. Can. Which means I am able to pick up this pen. I can pick up this pen. Throw that away in the can. He hates the King James Bible. And so any chance, whether telling the truth or telling a lie, doesn't matter to him. He's going to speak evil of the King James Bible. Then we have the esteemed scholar, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace, the conservative. And see, James R. White calls himself, I'm a conservative scholar. So is Daniel Wallace, Dallas Theological Seminary. Here's what he said. And why I do not think the King James Bible is the best translation available today. First, I want to affirm with all evangelical Christians that the Bible is the Word of God, inerrant, inspired, and our final authority for faith and life. Well, that sounds good. However, nowhere in the Bible am I told that not only one translation of it is the correct one. Nowhere am I told that the King James Bible is the best or only holy Bible. There is no verse that tells me how God will preserve his word, so I can have no scriptural warrant for arguing that the King James has exclusive rights to the throne. Second, the Greek text which stands behind the King James Bible is demonstrably inferior in certain places. Third, the King James Bible has undergone three revi- Oh, he's telling the same lie since its inception in 1611, incorporating more than 100,000 changes. Which King James Bible is inspired their foot? See, he's not going to tell you what changes they made. They changed the spelling and corrected the printing errors. And that's it. Fourth, 300 words found in the KJV no longer bear the same meaning, such as suffer little children to come unto me, study to show thyself approved unto God. Should we really embrace a Bible as the best translation when it uses language that not only is not clearly understood anymore, but in fact has been at times perverted and twisted? See, he's blaming what Joseph Smith and others have done with the King James on everybody that reads a King James. Anybody can pervert what the King James says. That's not the fault of the Bible. Then he said, those who advocate that the KJV has exclusive rights to being called the Holy Bible are always curiously English-speaking people. Yeah. Yet Martin Luther's fine translation of the Bible into German predated the KJV by almost 100 years. Are we so arrogant to say that God has spoken only in English? I contend that the KJV has far more drastically altered the scriptures than have modern translations. He's lying. This Bible, the unchanged Bible, stands above all others. And yes, I believe that God speaks German, Dutch, Italian, Spanish, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. That's, and I've talked about this in several presentations, which Bible you be the judge. The case for a perfect Bible is another. Satan's biggest enemy is another. And I show you why there's differences between the Bibles. One of them has to be right. And I believe this one is by the majority of the evidence. I mentioned a guy earlier that I said, he, he doesn't just hate the King James. He hates all of them. Charles Stanley's son, Andy Stanley, mega church pastor. Here's what he said. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This is where our trouble began. The implication is, the Bible is a reason we believe. I can believe Jesus loves me because, that, because it's in the Bible. The problem with that is this. If the Bible is the foundation of our faith, <clears throat> it is. As the Bible goes, so goes our faith. You're right. Now let me stop right here. He's right on that. And the devil knows this. 
So the devil knows that if he can pervert God's word, he can pervert faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Andy. You can tell he don't read his Bible because he don't believe what it says. If the Bible is the foundation of our faith, it is all or nothing. Yep. Christianity becomes a fragile house of cards religion. No, it doesn't. Christianity becomes a fragile house of cards that comes tumbling down when we discover that perhaps the wall of Jericho didn't. Everything rises and falls and whether not part, but all the Bible is true. And that's unfortunate. And as we are going to discover today, unnecessary. The Christian faith does not exist because of the Bible. The Bible exists because of the Christian faith. He's a liar. Big time. See, I'm telling you, the purpose of even the New King James was to get the man of God away from this book, stepping over to the other translations, losing faith, because faith is from the Word of God. If you don't have the Word of God, you're going to lose the faith to eventually basing their doctrine on some other foundation other than the Word of God. And Andy Stanley's leading the charge. How do we get back to these old paths? We believe what God said first. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. We believe what God told Peter. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, Andy Stanley versus God. Who do you think is going to win in the end? Now, who's going to mislead millions of people? Andy Stanley and all the other Bible haters. But who's going to keep us faithful to the end? The words that I've handled in my hand, the word of life. People, guys like this are everywhere. They, their job, their goal is to draw you away from this book. Satan's goal is to get you so tied up with things of this life or things of this world or your research that you spend hours chasing rabbits, chasing wild geese, but you're not anchored in the Word of God. And see, we know there's a day coming. This is what, bo- this is what gets me the most. This is, what really, this is what really bothers me when I'm bothered like I am now, is that I know there's a day coming when a strong delusion is going to be delivered to this world. And if you think the devil hasn't figured out how you tick, you don't know him. He knows exactly the kind of lies that he can mislead you with to get you to fall in the evil day. The best medicine against it is to ground yourself in this book and don't leave it. You're the reason why I say these things because I love you. You're the reason why I do what I do. Don't forget that. I want you grounded and settled so that you're not moved away. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.